Okay, I think people are trickling in. I expect many people are still in the parks because there's a little bit of sunlight and that means there's probably still a few warblers, but um, good evening and welcome to the May 2022 meeting of the Linnaean Society of New York. I hope everyone has been enjoying spring, spring migration wherever you are, maybe even as you attend the meeting tonight. I will officially start by calling the meeting to order. This is our last meeting of the season, but we will be back on Zoom in September. And while we still don't have an update on when we will be back in the American Museum of Natural History, we hope to have more news on that front when we are back from summer break. Speaking of summer break, while we won't be holding our monthly lectures over the summer, we will still have plenty of field trips. So be sure to check our website from time to time for trips and exciting new content. On to logistics. We've disabled the chat feature. So if you have a question tonight, please type it into the Q&A box. Your video and microphone have also been disabled so you can sit back and enjoy the show. Our vice president, Gabriel Willow, is out in the field leading one of his spectacular walks and will not be able to join us tonight. In his place, Patrick McKenzie, a society member and doctoral candidate in evolutionary biology at Columbia University, will be filling in and answering select, select questions that have been added to the Q&A at the conclusion of the lecture. And now on to business. Thank you to everyone who submitted votes on the items listed in last week's president's letter. The results are as follows. Motion number one, to accept the following members of the Linnaean Society passed unanimously with 127 in favor and zero opposed. New members and sponsors are Aaron Stern, sponsored by Mindy Kaufman, Frederica Miller, sponsored by Ken Chea, Layla Javits, sponsored by Maggie Bradley, Christina Sacco, sponsored by Maggie Bradley, Andy Shawhan, sponsored by Miriam Murkowski, Carmen M. Ramos, sponsored by Maggie Bradley, Jared Meek, Ashley Toth, Jim Toth, all sponsored by yours truly, and Yao Seng Chen, sponsored by Will Pap. Welcome to our newly elected members. If anyone out there is looking to become a member tonight, please visit our website, LinnaeanNewYork.org. Motion number two to accept the April 2022 meeting minutes also passed with 126 in favor and one opposed. Sometime over the summer, members will receive a renewal pack in the mail. In an attempt to save a few trees and perceive the flexibility required of all of us these days, we are scaling back on our paper schedule of events. We will provide you with a list of programs and field trips, but ask that you utilize our website for more up-to-date information. Your renewal packet will also contain a notice about our annual homecoming picnic, which we have sadly missed since it was last held in 2019. And probably most excitingly, we hope to have new Linnaean Society hats you can order. If where did you see the Blackburnian is the most frequent question I'm asked when I'm in Central Park, when are you going to order new hats is surely the second. And now without further ado, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Melanie Stiasny. Dr. Stiasny is the Axelrod Research Curator in the Department of Ichthyology at the American Museum of Natural History, in addition to being an adjunct professor at Columbia University. Before coming to New York, she was an assistant professor of biology at Harvard University. And after earning her PhD at the University of London, she spent three years of postdoctoral research in the Netherlands. Dr. Stiasny's extensive research throughout the world, throughout the world's tropic, tropical waters focuses on evolution, behavior, and conservation of fishes. Tonight, she will present on the fish found in the heart of Africa and the lower Congo River where we can find almost 300 spe different species, some of them with very unique adaptations and morphologies. And with that, I pass the mic to you, Dr. Stiasny. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And let me go straight away. I'll share my screen and we can get going. So, okay. So, um, Rochelle, again, thanks for inviting me to give this presentation this evening. And I have to admit to um, feeling a bit trepidatious speaking to an audience of the Linnaean Society of New York. I mean, I, I don't study birds and, and you know not everyone's perfect. I, I'm an ichthyologist, but hopefully um, there's gonna be enough here that I'm gonna talk about um, that's gonna be of general interest, even to the non-ichthyologists among you in the audience. Now, for all of my career, my, my heart has been in Africa. And a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is probably best described as exploration biology, trying to get a handle on how Africa's fish diversity is partitioned, both geographically and phylogenetically. And then if possible, 
trying to gain an understanding of how all this came to be. Now, I've been at it for quite a while. The, the Congo project uh, be began- oh, okay. Melanie, I'm yeah. sorry. We don't, we don't see your um, slides. If you, did you mean to share them? I thought I did. Um, yeah. I'm terribly sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, okay, let me go back. Let me end the slideshow. Okay. Um, I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Now we're in business. Now do you see? So, yep. so now, now do you hang on? Now do you see? Now you see the slide? That is perfect. Yes, we see it. Excellent. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know, I don't know what happened, but anyway. <laughs> Okay, to get back to what I was saying, um, for, for nearly all of my career, my heart's been in Africa, and, and I am going to be talking, what I'm talking about today is really exploration biology. You know, how do we explain the distribution of fishes on the continent? And as I say, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, the Congo project started back in 2006, so there's a lot to talk about, and, and I really do apologize if any of you there are already familiar with, with much of the story I'm going to tell you. But you know, the Lower Congo River, which is where I'm gonna be focusing my talk, is a truly amazing place and it's always turning up something new. So I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll get the answer to this oft posed, oft -posed question. Like you've been doing it since 2006, why is she still there? Okay, so um, really to, to, to get to that, I need to situate the, the, the Congo. And for some reason, my slides, I'm terribly sorry. Yeah, it seems to be going. Yeah, so the, the sorry, okay. I'm totally inept at this, I really apologize. Okay, so to do that, let's quickly situate the Congo Basin. Now the Congo Basin is the freshwater heart of Africa. It's a place of superlatives. It's the world's second largest river basin, draining some 37, th uh, sorry, 3.7, million square kilometers of Central Africa, and that's about the size of Western U Europe. Now, the Congo River provides food and livelihoods for the millions of people who live in this vast region. And with literally only a few hundred kilometers of year-round paved road, the river itself provides 14 and a half thousand kilometers of navigable passage across Central Africa. And it's really the central means of trans transportation and trade forming a real lifeline throughout this massive region. Yet the Congo River has also, and here it is in blue, the Congo River has also played an important role in structuring by Africa's biodiversity, not just the aquatic diversity, but the terrestrial diversity also. So if we look at our two closest relatives, the, the chimps, we'll see that the chimpanzee is only found to the north of the Congo River. And the bonobo is only found to the south of the Congo River. Now, was there ever a time when these two species, our two closest relatives, were ever sympatric? They occurred together. And another way of asking that is, has the Congo River itself always looked the way it does today? And the answer to that is, is no. Um, now, while our current understanding of the complex history of the Congo Basin is incomplete, all indications are that the basin has had a protracted history of intermittent outflows of the Atlantic. So sometimes it was flowing to the Atlantic, sometimes it was a landlocked basin or basins. And that outflow to the Atlantic has shifted through time. But none of those earlier outflows are the current outflow, the Lower Congo River. So here it is here, and this is what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, recent tectonic activity has been implicated in the final capture of the Congo Basin uh, through the high energy regime, regime of the Lower Congo. And we think that that wasn't established until sometime between five to two million years ago. So while the Congo Basin itself has been around for a very long time, our study region, the Lower Congo, is actually a very young part of the, the Congo Basin. And that's this young part of the Congo Basin is what I'm going to be focusing on for this talk. Okay, so, so here is the Lower Congo River, the LCR. It represents a very small percentage of the area of the entire basin. It's less than 2%, and it's incredibly short. It's only about 
350 kilometers is the actual lower Congo. Now, the first people to look at this and publish it in a paper back in 1976 were Robertson Stewart. And these people were the first to show that this short stretch of river, for fishers at least, is a very interesting place. They recorded 129 species, but perhaps more importantly, they found that 34 of those species were endemic. That means they were only found in the lower Congo. Now, since then, we have recorded the presence of over 330 species, with over 85 of them being Lower Congo endemics. So this short stretch is home to nearly 30% of all fish species found in the entire Congo Basin, and of those, 30% are endemic to the Lower Congo. So the Lower Congo is a real hotspot of fish diversity in the Congo Basin. And in fact, it's a standout hotspot across the continent. Now, of course, the question is, is why? But before I get down to that, I, I want to stress that everything that I'm gonna be talking about this evening has been a hugely collaborative effort. Um, and over the years, I've had the pleasure of working with many colleagues and students. And from the beginning, I've been working with a great team of Congolese ichthyologists. And, and here are just some of the core members. They all started as students, but now three of them, and soon to be four, um, are professors at Congolese universities. And I'm, I'm so proud to see them now reaching out to their own students, like Miriam Yoko here, um, and introducing them to the uh, delights of Congolese ichthyology. Um, working with these guys has been a tremendous pleasure, and it's been tremendously re rewarding, and very much a core goal of my work in Congo is to make sure that when I'm, I'm no longer doing it, we'll have this cadre of Congolese who can keep on this work. And of course, the rest of the current crew and all of their work and the work of many others that I just don't have space uh, to put on this slide have contributed greatly to this, to this project. And I just wanna quickly shout out to um, Liz Alter, um, who's been my main collaborator over many years now. And she's a terrific biologist and her expertise in molecular biology has been tremendously important, as I hope to show in the rest of this talk. So shout out to Liz. Okay, now let's get back to that question. Why is the Lower Congo such a hotspot of diversity? Now to, to, to get to that question, let's, let's or to answer that question, let's look more closely at the river. And here it is from its outflow of Paul Malabo down to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, remember, when the Congo reaches this point, it's drained 3.7 million square kilometers of Central Africa. And the annual discharge from the pool into the lower Congo is over 46,000 cubic meters a second. And this enormous volume of water, that's nearly three times the volume of the Mississippi, that enormous volume of water flows down an extremely narrow bedrock constrained gorge on its convoluted route to the Atlantic. And it does this while dropping some 280 meters, over 90 uh, feet, uh, 900 feet on its way to the Atlantic. And the result are huge series of high energy rapids. And I'm just gonna show you a very, very short clip of this video just to give of the power of these rapids. Now, you're not looking at the ocean. All right, each weighing about 30 tons. That's the Lower Congo River. Now, one of the first things we needed to do when we started this project was to actually locate where on the long, along the Lower Congo these rapids were situated. And this map here, I know it's very small, but it shows our collecting sites over the years. And it actually at this scale looks pretty good, but in reality, our, our sampling just scrapes the surface. For most of the length of the Lower Congo, it flows through deep gorges with very, very little road access. And even when you can get to the river, um, the river is essentially non-navigable for much of its length due to these enormous rapids. 
And as a result, despite, despite years of our sampling in this system, our sampling is incomplete. And this is a real issue. I mean, every time we go, we find new taxa, we find new fish species. Often, even when we return to areas where we've been before, we'll find new species. But equally often, when we go back to sites where we found interesting fish that we want more of, we can't find them again. The habitats are so complex and, and so varied along the lower Congo that in many ways fishing here is like looking for needles in an endless haystack of very rocky, in an endless series of very rocky haystacks, and most of them you can't even get to. So basically what we had to do was to rely on, on reconstruction of remotely sensed data, so satellite data. And we used the differences in reflectance from the water surface. Now, we're not looking at land cover. We're talking of reflectance from the water surface. And we use this as surrogates for different habitat types. In this case, the blue deep calm water, then you'll see the light blue is some white water rapids and other habitats. But let's just stop it here. Um, OK, so at this point, we were concerned with mapping fully cross-channel rapids. And, he, and here's an example, because we thought, and it makes sense, that such fully cross-channel rapids likely form barriers for the migration of fish, fishes, so the integration of populations of fishes on either side of those bar barriers. So we would score something like this as a cross-channel rapid. And we compiled these along the length of the lower Congo. And in this, at a very, very broad scale, is our mapping of the location of the major cross-channel rapids along the LCR. Now, much of our, our work, and particularly our earlier work, has been aimed at investigating the impact of these potential barriers, longitudinally arrayed barriers, along the lower Congo, and to look at how that may affect um, population dynamics and speciation along the, along the system. And perhaps not at all surprisingly, just about all of the, our studies have, have documented longitudinal structuring of species and populations along the lower Congo River associated with the rapids. Now, I'm sorry this graphic is a bit busy, but I'm simply using it as a surrogate for many of our studies. The bottom line is that we have tons of evidence that rapids do form barriers to varying degrees, and they have likely acted as promoters of speciation in the past and are continuing to promote diversification within species, as is indicated in this top panel uh, today. And this is an example of some work done by one of my graduate students, Naoko Kurata. And um, it's just really illustrating this fact. So some species are distributed completely allopatrically, they don't overlap, and they're separated from each other by, from rapids. And within species, as I say, population divergence seems to be taking place at the moment. Now, that large cross-channel rapids are dividing up and isolating populations of fish makes perfect sense. But perhaps what's most noteworthy is the geographical scales of which this is happening in the lower Congo River. And in many ways, it's this that makes the system so extraordinary. For example, in this study, we used um, genome-wide uh, data to investigate population divergence. And here we concentrated on the effect of this big rapid, the first big rapid outside of Paul Malabo. Now, again, I, I won't go into detail, but the bottom line is that despite the very short distance between the populations here and the populations here, less than one and a quarter kilometer, um, that's actually less than the distance between Hoboken and Chelsea, separated by the Hudson River. Um, these populations are pretty much isolated from one another. You very, very rarely see um, a, a, an individual from here breeding with an individual from here, which is probably true from Hoboken and Chelsea, but probably for other reasons. Anyway, um, so extremely fine scale. So I've, as I've said, that rapid form barriers make sense. And the Lower Congo story could actually end there, and it would still be super interesting because of the extremely fine geographical scales of some of these processes. But it turns out things are more complicated, and they're actually more interesting. Now, for example, we had begun to find instances of populations, fish populations, 
diverging from each other across sections of the lower Congo River where there were no rapids and there were no obvious barriers between populations. And one finding um, completely changed our view of the Lower Congo River and it all hinged around the discovery of this fish. This is the blind cichlid, Lamprologus lethops. Now, lethops has been found only in a very small area of the Congo, Lower Congo, around the village settlement of Bulu. It's the only known blind cichlid, which is unusual because some of you will know cichlids are hugely species rich and they've done all sorts of things in the Great Lakes of Africa, but they haven't lost their eyes and their sight. Um, so this is the only known blind cichlid, but what's much more unusual about this fish is that it is only ever found dead or dying at the water surface. Now, this surely has to be one of the most unusual biological situations. It's like finding a population of mountain goats that regularly fall off mountains and kill themselves. I mean, clearly that's pretty much unheard of. Anyway, over the years, we've gathered numerous specimens of this fish, but always dead or more abundant, nearly dead, and always from around this, this main region of the lower Congo. Now on one trip, some of the local fishers brought us one specimen that was moribund, but it was still alive. And as I hold it in my hand and it died, bubbles, I saw it happen, bubbles slowly formed under its skin and all over its gills. This fish appeared to be suffering, sorry, from catastrophic decompression syndrome. That's kind of like the, the fish's equivalent of the bends. Now, up until then, all of our work had been concentrated on rapids and looking at the effect of rapids on longitudinal structuring in populations. And rapids are shallow water phenomena. Now, with the discovery, with the finding of this fish uh, and dying from catastrophic decompression, the question was raised is could there be deep water here in the lower Congo? Now, it's a long story how we, we finally resolve this, but very briefly, um, with colleagues from the US Geological Survey, we deployed these um, amazing instruments, acu acoustic Doppler current profilers. And with this setup, we were not only able to measure you know, what the bottom of the channel looked like, but more importantly, we were actually able to visualize flow dynamics through the, throughout the water column. And the bottom line is, we not only found extraordinarily complex and turbulent flows that were not associated with rapids, but we also found incredibly deep holes and canyons. And I want very briefly to um, just, just show you some of, some of our results. So in this slide, we're looking at a cross section here at bend, bend two. So you're standing in the river channel, here's one bank, there's a one bank to your left, one bank to your right. You're looking straight up at the water coming towards you. Now, this, this place at Ben 2, where we took, made this transect, um, this is where most specimens of that blind cichlid lethops had been found. Not all of them by any means, but most of them. Now, first, let me draw your attention to, to the bottom of the channel. Now, look at this, we're talking at a depth of about 160 meters, that's over 520 feet deep. That's the deepest point in any river that has ever been recorded. So yes, there is deep water in the, in the lower Congo. But let's also look at these water currents. Now remember, you're, you're in the channel and you're looking up at the water. Now these have been color coded so that the Orange, it's been color coded to show vertical velocities, up down velocities. So the blue, the orange and the yellows are going straight up, and the blues and the greens are coming straight down. So what we see are these persistent cells of upwelling and downwelling water, and then interspersed between them are, in red are these jets, vertical jets that rapidly transport water from the benthos, from the bottom of this canyon, straight up to the water surface. 
Now this little inset on your um, bottom, I don't know if you see it as left or right, but it's on my left, perhaps it's on your right. Um, it's actually uh, showing you what these, these boils and suck holes over these canyons actually look like. And to give you a bit of scale, these are actually two kayakers who are, who are risking their lives getting too close to this um, boil. Anyway, we hypothesize that this blind fish, Lethops, is living at or close to the rocky bottom in this canyon. And it occasionally becomes entrained in one of these, these upward fast moving jets. And such a scenario would, would result in their, in their catastrophic, because they couldn't resist that, they would be brought up to the surface and that would result in their catastrophic decompression and death at the water's surface. But we have absolutely no case, no um, evidence that this is, in, is the case. Um, we couldn't go down there and, and look at it, um, but I'm gonna get to that more of that in a minute. So just to back up a second. So in places we found the lower Congo is incredibly deep and has some extraordinary um, high energy water flow. But let's, let's look at another place. So now we're looking at bend one. Now at bend one, and here's a photograph of it, it looks completely calm. There's, there's, there are no rapids, there are no vortices, there's no boils and suck holes. Now let's look at a cross section here. So here we are again in the river channel. And this time, <clears throat> the colors that you're looking at are representing streamwise velocity. So the reds and the yellows are coming straight at you very fast. And the blues and the greens are actually flowing in the opposite direction. It's really like rivers within rivers. Now, the regions of low flow and velocity that are not only going in the opposite direction from this central core, they're also completely isolated from each other by this sheer zone of flow separation that spans vertically the entire water column. Now, these bank habitats are only separated from each other by, by about half a kilometer. So now we're really talking about fine scale, half a kilometer. But if you're a small fish living here or a small fish living here, there's no way you could swim across without being entrained in this and plunging down towards the Atlantic. So even in the absence of rapids where, where the water seems so calm, we can see how the extraordinary flow dynamics the high energy complex dynamics of the lower Congo River are actually promoting the separation of populations. Now, we're terrestrial animals and we think if there's water and you're a fish, you can swim around in it. But clearly in the lower Congo, that, that's, that's not the case. Okay, so I said that the canyon at Bulu at 160 meters um, is the deepest point in any river in the world. But there are places along the lower Congo that make the Bulu Canyon look like a paddling pool. Now, to get at that, we pers persuaded a group of crazy kayakers, um, whitewater kayakers, to let us trick out their um, kayaks with differential GPS so we knew exactly where they were in the water. And then we had to drill a hole in the bottom of their kayaks, which they really didn't like, but they let us do it and put an echo sounder in it. And we put them into the river at Kinsuka and we took them out here. And what you're seeing here is this single line longitudinal transect made by the kayakers between Kinsuka and Pioka. Now, this trace has not been corrected for the pitch and roll of the kayak, so we still need to do that. But just look at the depth of some of these holes. This one here, for example, is nearly 800 um, feet deep. That's over 235 meters deep. Um, truly phenomenal. Okay, so let's quickly get back to, to that lithops puzzle. I said that with lithops, we're making a lot of guesses about its habitat, its ecology, its life history. I mean, based on its appearance and on how we only find it dead or dying of decompression in the region of a deep canyon, we hypothesize that Lethops lives in a deep canyon in a lightless environment. But as I said, we've no proof of this. There's no way we can go down there 
and make direct observations. It would be easier, it is easier to get to the bottom of the Marianas Trench than it would be to get to the bottom of the, the Bulu Canyon because of the incredible energy of the hydrant of the water down there. Um, so we can't make direct observations. Now, some anatomical comparisons are su certainly supportive of this notion that um, Lithops is, is, is living at depths. Um, for example, you know, its eyes are embedded underneath its skull. They've lost uh, the ability to form an image. All its eyes can do is tell the difference between light and dark. There are all sorts of features about what's happened to its eyes that suggest that it, it, it isn't living in a, a, a lighted environment. Um, there are other features of its anatomy that, sorry about this. Oh my, oh my God, so, one second. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. It's some um, pandemic dogs. We, we've got lots of them and we're fostering lots. Anyway, so, so there's some anatomical evidence that, that these things do live at, at depth. And perhaps the most convincing or the most suggestive piece of anatomy, I believe I'm not gonna dwell too much on anatomy, but the most convincing piece is that this is a normal cichlid. This, this, this is a, a cichlid that lives in the, in the surface waters near where um, Lithops lives. And like most cichlids, um, they're physiclistus. That means that their swim bladder here, this gas bladder, is not connected to the gut. And because of that, they're very sensitive to um, changes in depth and pressure. And it takes them a very long time to, to um, equilibrate if they, if they move up and down. And we think that this thin walled, um, it's called the tunica externa, the thin wall of the gas bladder is, is probably why they have such a poor ability. I mean, they're very good at maneuvering at the level they're at, but they can't go up and down readily. Now, given the extreme hydraulic conditions potentially exposing lithops to this rapid up up upward transport and rapid decompression, it would be reasonable to anticipate that a, a, a reduced or absent gas bladder would be adaptive for something like um, lithops. However, this is absolutely not the case. And lithops, in contrast, has a, as an enlarged gas bladder, and it has a very thick walled um, outer layer, the tunica externa, is extremely strong and thick, and it's constrained within a um, hypertrophied, uh, an enlarged or strengthened rib cage. Now, all of these attributes, <clears throat> attributes of lithops would limit gas bladder expansion as it comes up and down, and it would serve to allow lithops possibly to go a little bit more up and down and perhaps be able to look for food and maneuver over and above rocks and crevices, and even perhaps in pockets of downwelling or calm water. Um, so it may be adaptive, but this, the fact that it has such a different kind of gas, gas bladder is definitely suggestive that it's living at depth. But interestingly, we do have some additional data that further supports a hypothesis of lithops living at depth. And it comes from the genomic um, side of our studies. And don't worry, I'm not going to um, go into any detail of this side of our research, although it's beginning to look pretty interesting. Um, but I do want quickly to point out two rather interesting findings that speak to that question of where is Lithops living? Now, while the main focus of our comparative genomic studies have been on exploring the underpinnings of vision loss and, and loss of pigmentation, um, and we do this by comparing the genome of lithops with a bunch of normal cichlids. When we were doing this, we serendipitously found that in lithops, many of the genes um, implicated in the repair of ultraviolet damage to the genes. Um, so, uh, so we were looking at loss of function mutations. We found that many of those ultraviolet repair genes have actually lost their function in lithops. They've been broken. They've completely lost their function. Now, this is not to say that lithops might not have other ways to fix its DNA damage from ultraviolet light, but it does seem to be strong supporting evidence that they are living at depth where they are not exposed to much, if any, ultraviolet light. And as a result, there's been relaxed selection and no need to maintain elaborate 
ultraviolet light repair mechanisms. So that's one piece. Now here's another piece of, of, of evidence or, or that suggests that we're right about the habitat. We found that lethops sh also shows mutations, loss of function mutations in a gene related to the lack of appetite suppression. This is the gene SPX for spexin. And loss of function in spexin results in the loss of appetite su suppression. And that means pauses, binge eating. Um, I think that's what I think I must have downregulated spexin, but anyway. As a result, organisms like lethops that have downregulated or lost spexin, they tend to be very fat and starvation resistant. Now, this little CT scan, I can talk a little bit more about those in a minute, um, shows us, so here's lethops and here's its surfing, surface dwelling um, congener, same genus, but this one lives at the surface and this is lethops. And you can see all of this fat lipid accumulation in lethops. Now, interestingly, you've got another comparison here. This is the Astyanex mexicanus, the, 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 the Mexican cave tetra. And this is the cave dwelling form, and this is the surface dwelling form. And we have a very similar situation of lots of fat globules and lipid sequestration in the cave dwelling form, like lethops, um, but not in the surface dwelling form. Now, interestingly, in this case, we have the same kind of morphology, the same phenotype, the, the, the sequestration of fat and lipids, but it's completely different genetic mechanism. It's not spexin that's causing this. It's um, mutations in another gene, melanocortin-4 receptor. And that gene, interestingly, is linked to anorexia in humans. So it's a really nice case of where you've got the same basic um, thing happening, but completely different genes are controlling it. Anyway, loss of function of spexin makes perfect sense if lethops, as we hypothesize, lives at the bottom of a deep canyon where food is only sporadically available. It makes sense to binge eat when food is there and then to rely on stored fat reserves when it's not. Okay, so these genomic studies are only just begun, beginning, but um, I hope you see that we're already finding a, a few interesting results. Okay, so to summarize up to this point, um, the Lower Congo is clearly, clearly a highly unusual riverine system. It's, it's rocky shoreline habitats, it's heterogeneous um, channel topology with, with deep canyons immediately adjacent to, to shallow rapids has resulted in, in a complex and extremely um, dynamic set of flow regimes. And in short, our findings suggest that the, it's the river itself that may be a powerful driver for microalopatric speciation. So populations being separated, but across very, very short, small distances, um, facilitating this in these complex shoreline habitats over remarkably small geographical scales. Now, obviously, acting over time, such a system will generate a lot of diversity. So it's a really, really cool system, uh, probably globally unique. And I'm still there, and it's still turning up new things. I mean, I've already alluded to the fact that on each trip that we go to one of these places, we find new taxa. But most of these new fish species we find are pretty normal looking in the sense that they, they're, they're distinct from other typical members of the fish families that they belong to, but not all of them are. And I've already mentioned um, lethops, the strange blind cichlid. But then there are also these. Now, I should point out that none of these, un unlike lethops, none of these are routinely found dead or dying at the water surface. As far as we can tell, none of these are living at extreme depth like lethops. Yet all of them have lost or greatly reduced the image forming capabilities of their eyes, and we call that cryptophthalmia. All of them are completely depigmented. And despite these very different shapes and sizes, and very different phylogenetic histories. 
they've all converged on a very similar set of, of very striking um, body forms, phenotypes. Now, this is the phenomenon of evolutionary convergence, when evolution independently produces derived yet remarkably similar traits. And this provides a, a powerful natural system to, to study adaptive evolution. And what makes this system in the Lower Congo so, so powerful is the fact that it's observed across multiple distantly related fish families. This is perhaps the most extreme example of morphological convergence across phylogenetically disparate, dis distantly related lineages that's been found within a single system, making it an outstanding and maybe unique model to investigate the, 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 the morphological and ecological and genomic underpinnings of the response to this extraordinarily highly um, selective riverine regime. Now this is work in progress and I really don't have much time to go into detail. So I'm gonna really whiz through this. I forgot to turn on my timer, so I've got no idea how long I've been talking. Anyway, I just wanna give you a little idea of the direction in which we're going. And I do need to say that what makes this system so powerful that these cryptophthalmic fissures um, are so distantly related what makes that so powerful also presents a major problem. It, I mean, it's virtually meaningless to compare a cichlid with an elephant fish, a more myrid. Um, they are so distant from each other. I mean, it's like comparing a, a wombat to a dachshund, or perhaps to this audience, I should say, it's like com comparing a kiwi to a parrot. Um, they are just so phylogenetically divergent and anatomically different. So that's a, that's a problem. How do we begin to explore this, this convergence between them? And the way we did this um, very briefly and simply is we took a comparison. So we have the cryptophthalmic cichlid and we compared it with a member of its genus that lives in the same region. And we did this with the elephant nose fish. We did it with the spiny eels. We did it with all these examples of cryptophthalmia in the Lower Congo. And we hope that by taking this couplet approach, by comparing the, the blind cryptophthalmic thing with the normal thing, maybe some anatomical generalities would become evident. And we did it using, uh, we chose to use um, CT scanning technology. And again, I don't have time to go into the details of it, but basically, this is a technology probably you all, many of you have your, had your knees scanned and various other things. And basically, um, you just take x-rays from many different angles, and then you put them all together, and you can get this three-dimensional representation. Now, the reason that we did this first in the first instance is using CT scans, you can actually virtually dissect things. You don't have to destroy specimens to do this. And as many of the fish that we're talking about are very rare, and we only have very few individuals, this is very, very important. But secondly, because we've been comparing, you know, morpho morphologies between a kiwi and a parrot, things are so divergent. The thing about CT scans is that you can begin, and the processing that you can do to them, you can really begin to visualize things and compare them. So, Here's an example. This is a new cichlid we found. We have one individual of it. Turns out to be the sister species of Lethox. And you can see we, can, we don't have to damage that specimen, but with CT scanning, we can really look deep, deeply at its anatomy. And we can do all sorts of things with the data. We can look at bone densities so we can begin to understand uh, functional differentiation between species. And we can get good three-dimensional spatial um, sense of, of what's going on with these fish. So it's a, it's a great set of technologies. But we need to look um, not just at bone or, or other calcified structures, we also need to look at soft tissues, the, the muscles, um, the nerves and the, and the brain, um, sensory systems. And to do this, we now have a methodology which involves staining specimens with various kinds of stains that, allow, that have a differential uptake of these radio molecules. And we can actually visualize soft structure, soft tissues. 
And that's been hugely um, useful. Not only can we virtually, without damaging these specimens, we can virtually dissect out individual muscles and pieces of anatomy. And here we're looking at the cheek muscles that control the jaws. Um, you can have the potential to actually quantify differences. So we can actually look at cross sections, we can take volumes, and we can even look at the direction of, of, the fi of fibers within a muscle and begin to look at mechanical forces. And here's another example. Here's a, of lithops. I'm looking at the, the cranium. I've covered the top of the head. These are the ear bones. I won't go into detail, but I can actually um, put the brain and sensory organs in there using this technique. And you can really get a very novel overview, particularly of spatial relations uh, using these techniques. Um, and you can begin to look in, in quite some detail. Um, so for example, and now I'm just showing off with um, the technology, but you can actually do virtual dissections. You, you can see things by virtually dissecting them that you just simply cannot see if you just look at the external um, surface of the structure. So it's been hugely, um, hugely helpful. And we can use this, and again, I'm probably going on too long, but we can look at, we can begin to characterize, we can mine these anatomies to look for features that really help us to um, define what it is, what is, what is this convergence? How are these things similar or different? And there's just two examples here looking at the cryptophthalmic form and the normal form. We're looking at a, an obscure piece of brain anatomy. I won't go into details, but you can clearly see there are big differences and same with other bits of anatomy. And we can do that now with all of the different families of cryptophthalmic species. So here we can, you can see that the brain of a cichlid is very different from the brain of a, a spiny eel or a, 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 a chlorid catfish. But certain similarities by doing this couplet comparison, so the blind one, the sighted one, the blind one, the sighted one, blind one, the sighted one, you can begin to see generalities about what's going on. And, and in this case, you can clearly see that the ear bones of, of the blind, the cryptophthalmic form, are larger than they are in the sighted form. And, and that makes perfect sense, obviously. Um, and uh, or, or if we look at the, uh, the form of the, the cerebellum of the brain, you can see in the sighted forms, the cerebellum is much more clearly defined and a discrete st structure, whereas it's more diffuse and amorphous in the cryptophthalmic form. And this makes perfect sense. The cerebellum is organizing orientation in a three-dimensional world for these guys. These guys are presumably just living on the bottom and they don't need that three-dimensional world. So, okay, um, the, these studies were really just beginning when uh, Lord COVID hit. Um, and I'd hope to make much more progress than I have at this point. But I hope you'll agree that these results are, are beginning to look pretty promising. So I've probably run out of time. I, I don't know. Um, I've certainly run out of steam. So I'm gonna wind down here, um, but I, I clearly there's much more work to be done, but I hope that I've convinced you that the lower Congo River really is an extraordinary place. In many ways, this is a global treasure and, it, and it's certainly a treasure trove for investigating a whole set of questions relating to diversification and adaptation in, in these extreme uh, freshwater systems. And that is why I'm still there. It's always turning up new stuff. But what makes this system so extraordinary? It's extreme hydrology. And here you remember that elevational drop of 280 meters in less than, in this case, less than 300 kilometers. It's that extraordinary hydrology that's given this treasure trove of, of fishes in this system. But it's that extreme hydrology that places this system under such dire threat. Now, obviously, the hydropower potential of the system is enormous. A major dam development has been an ever present threat, with new proposals and deals being announced on and off through the decades. 
but a very recent agreement between the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo and um, Fortescue Metals Group is, is cause for serious concern. This latest proposal calls, calls for a staged series of dams um, together called the Grand Inga um, project. There'll be a huge backup reserve, um, reservoir. Now, the estimated potential of this, this Grand Inga sweep is over 40 gigawatts of energy. Now, listen to this, that's twice the output of the Three Gorges Dam. The Three Gorges Dam is the largest dam that exists on our planet. So it's twice the output of the Three Gorges Dam. So clearly the temptations are, are enormous. Now, I'm not qualified to lecture on the history of the failures of such pharaonic um, dam building. But I do know that if this is put into place, um, this would devastate the lower Congo ecosystem. It would displace and disenfranchise thousands of people. It would cut off Af Central Africa's sediment load to the Congo plume out into the Atlantic, a massive fan of water and sediment ex extending some 300,000 square kilometers into the Atlantic. And this is a carbon sink of global importance. These dams could cause that to completely co collapse. Now, happily, I'm not alone in this assessment. And for those of you who are interested, you can follow this, this link um, to a recent IUCN resolution urging the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo to take these concerns into consideration. And this is very much an active and an ongoing issue. Okay, with that, I'll stop. Um, but I can't end without um, acknowledging all of the people who live alongside this amazing river. They know more about the fishes living there than I ever will. And all of the work I've told you about today, this evening, um, simply could never have happened without their support, encouragement, and expertise. And with that, I'm gonna shut up and stop screen sharing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, it was an amazing talk. I hope everybody at home is also clapping in their living rooms or wherever they might be. <laughs> maybe out in maybe out in the park looking at birds. Um, that was a, a fascinating uh, story about drivers of uh, fish diversity in the Lower Congo and drivers of adaptation. And then a, um, a, a, I was sad, but I was grateful for the conservation connection at the end as well. Um, I'm going to start off by saying um, for those who are attending from home, please um, feel welcome to put your questions in the Q&A box. I'll be seeing those as they roll in and um, selecting um, them as they come up. Um, and so I'll go ahead and jump off. We already have a question about the Congo River generally, um, whether it's a physical barrier for chimps and bonobos or, or other species. And I actually have a similar question sort of framed in like whether, you know, you, you hear about um, kind of barriers between populations, um, you know, either being like, like, you know, this chimp isn't able to get across the river um, versus whether there's some underlying uh, maybe geological difference between the two sides of the river and the river might actually be kind of signaling um, an edge between those two different geologies. So do you have any response to that? Well, yeah, I mean, and the answer is we still don't know. But it's certainly, it is certainly the case that the time, the timing of if, if our assessment of when the Lower Congo finally captured the Congo Basin, and it's between two to five million years ago, that would kind of mesh with when, when the bonobo and the chimp were roughly thought to have diverged from each other. So it's possible that the river is the cause of that separation. But it's, it, yeah, it, it's, it's not clear. What is clear, you don't find chimps on the south of the Congo and you don't find those <laughs> to the north. But yeah, so it's still a bit of an open question, but the timing, sure. seems, to be, the timing seems to mesh. Sure. Have you observed that 
other species have similar kind of distinctions right there? Oh, yeah, right there yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the Congo River has clearly played some role, and it's unclear. And it's with birds, too. I mean, and they can fly, but, you know. Um, <laughs> It, the Congo has definitely played a, a big role in structuring diversity. So there are a lot of things only found to the north and a lot of things that are only found to the south. But the timing and the causation, it, it's all a little iffy and I, we don't know exactly, but uh, sure. certainly suggestive. Sure. Um, I'll move on to another question. So there are a couple questions about sort of the geology and the the hydrology of, of the lower sure. Congo and asking about whether um, you know anything about why that part of the river is so turbulent and also something about you know like what the ge what geological history led to it having such a kind of dramatic shape yeah no I know it's incredible it, I mean it looks it's certainly in places it looks like the 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 the, con the lower Congo is below sea level not like has depths below sea level at places um you know, because there's not diamonds there, there hasn't been that much geological work done on the Lower Congo. But I mean, the, the, the current idea is that, that probably the present Lower Congo that we know today um, represents what's called an elongogen, a, a, a fault that's, that kind of stopped and then get, got reactivated. So probably formed when, when um, South America and Africa were once together as part of Southern Gondwana land. And as it separated, this fault maybe began to form and then it stopped, you know? And then, as I said, sometime between five and two million years ago, tectonic activity, which caused the uplift of the Cameroonian highlands, probably reactivated that fault. So what we're looking at in the lower Congo is very probably something like a rift valley that was kind of quiescent and then kind of opened up and captured the, the, the main basin of the Congo. So that's the idea at the moment. Um, and it's kind of seen, kind of makes sense. And otherwise, what on earth do you have this incredible, deep, high energy system at the end of a giant river? I mean, all, all other global rivers, you know, start high energy and they slowly meander down and end up quietly going to the sea. The Congo is the reverse of that. It does, it does all of that and it meanders across Central Africa and then it hits Paul Malabo and it, and it just drops down um, off, off the escarpment. And yeah, it's very, very unique. It's very unusual. Sure. Yeah, no, I think of the, of the Mississippi River. I grew up in Arkansas and, and it starts to like pan out down there and, and I know. totally yeah, opposite. I mean, uh, right. Think about it, all of that water, you know, much, much, much more water than comes out of the Mississippi. That is flowing out of Paul Malabo through into a gorge that is one and a quarter kilometers across in place and yeah. a quarter of a kilometer across in other places. So imagine all of that volume of water going down there. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's why it's so crazy. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and kind of on a, I think, a, a similar um, line of, of, of question, um, we have one asking about other rivers in the world that might um, be good as replicates or sort of analogs to this study. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that would be terrific. I mean, I, I honestly don't know of any. I mean, the, these steps that I've been telling you about, I mean, they are unmatched anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I also said, you know, most rivers, you start off with the small streams and the headwaters and the little riffles and all of these things join together and you descend down in altitude and you get wider and you start meandering and then you form a delta and you go out to sea, right? The Congo doesn't do that. So mm -hmm. I think in that sense, it's, it's probably unique. There's probably other examples on a smaller scale, but certainly the Amazon doesn't have depths like this. The Yangtze doesn't have depths like this, so yeah. Sure. Do you know of like a, a general pattern between, you know, some of the characteristics you thought were important, like like the kind of hydrological complexity and like fish diversity generally, even when it's not as complex as this? Is it usually? Do you usually see more fish diversity in really um, relatively high-powered rivers? Yeah. No. Interestingly, you don't. 
generally tend to see such high fish diversity, but you often see high fish endemism. So you often get specialization. So you get species that are specialized to live in these um, rapids habitats. Um, so yeah, you expect degrees of endemism, but the, the degree of species richness and endemism in this system is, is really extraordinary. And, and I, think, um, I think it's kind of answered by, by look, looking at it and just imagining over time, of course, that's gonna generate a lot of um, speciation and diversification between populations resulting ultimately in speciation in this system. So I think that's why it's so rich. Sure. Um, I have another question um, from someone in the chat asking how you collect your fish. Do you use fish traps? Do you use nets? Do you use something else? Yeah, it's very hard, as I'm sure you can imagine with the sh showing you that kind of water system. So we used every possible, every possible technique to, to, to catch the fish. And as I've said, I think we've only scraped the surface. So the, the, the numbers of species that I've told you about are probably a, a huge underestimate. It's actually collecting is extremely different. Different. I mean, it's very, very difficult. So we'll use every um, fishing technique in the book and relying to, very heavily on local expertise. I mean, the, 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 there are fishermen in this, in this river who are just amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they know more about the fish, they know how to catch them, all of this. So we do rely very heavily on local fisher people to help us um, make our collections. But I think our collections are, are a huge underrepresentation of what's actually there. Definitely. Do you have any sense for how much remaining diversity there might be? Do like could you estimate how well, many species I mean, you think you if are they left put, to find? if they put in if they put in these big dams, <laughs> you can say there's going to be none. Um, yeah, I mean, the work of um, some of the work that we've done and some of the work that my graduate students and postdocs are doing are suggesting that this is evolution in action. I mean, it's it's going on now. It's it's happening now. So I think undoubtedly with time, we're going to find more and more things. Obviously, you know, now that we have these um, ways of looking at genetic diversification, that seems to be happening much more rapidly than the, 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 the accompanying morphological um, diversification. So uh, it doesn't mean they're not they're not really distinct. It's just um, very often they're going to look very similar to each other, but they have evidence in their genomes that they're not interbreeding. Uh, that's an interesting thing to think about when you're kind of going out in the field and 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 collecting fish from the river. How are you? You say you you know find new species almost every time you go. How are you doing that usually? Are you seeing similar morphological changes from place to place that you can quickly recognize as being different? Or are you usually sequencing them and then kind of diagnosing them as new species afterward? It's a, it's a bit of a mix, but mainly I would say it's actually just finding something that doesn't look like anything else that you've caught there before. And you know what's, what you know was there before, so you, then you can just follow it up. So morphological differentiation at the species level, definitely. But then also we'll look at some lineages and find they look the same, but when you look at the genes or you analyze the, the, the genomes, you see that they're, they're actually quite distinct or that they're certainly not in So it's a mixture of both. Sure. But a, a lot of them is just you look at it and say, I've not seen that before, that's new. Sure. Um, I have a question. Um, well, actually, first, I want to ask this question in the chat about um, uh, lithops, because I think that, you know, that's a pretty charismatic. It's such species. a cool fish. Um, do you have any information about the life cycle or the just kind of the general life history of that species? We know nothing. We know nothing. We have over the years, you know, managed to find or basically the local people find for us these dead bodies. So we have... We know that they range in size from, you know, about eight inches to the smallest one we've got is maybe an inch. So uh, we know that. I mean, one of the things that people always ask is, you know, well, what are they eating? You know, they're down there. It's what are they eating? And I wish I could answer that because the problem is that even though they have this reinforced swim ladder, they they seem to be pushed up to the surface so rapidly that. It, 
even though the swim bladder is, is reinforced and they've got big ribs and they're holding it in, it still bursts. And as it bursts, it expands and bursts. And as it expands, it pushes against the intestine and everything that was in their intestine gets squeezed out. So by the time they get to the surface and we get to them, the, the guts are completely empty. So we do not know what they're eating. That's fascinating. I would never yeah, have thought crazy. of that being a problem. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about something that I think about a lot. Um, I study plants and, and specifically plant kind of speciation. And we talk a lot about how speciation happens and, and um, sort of whether it happens in allopatry because of these, these barriers and between habitats and, and different kinds of river flow and everything, or whether it can happen because of ecological changes and adaptation. And mixed in with that is the ability of plants, and now we know many other species to hybridize with each other between species. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether you see hybridization in these fish we, looking, yeah. We, we do, it's certainly in, in many families. Now, now with these more refined um, genomic um, capabilities, it's becoming clearer and clearer that hybridization is not just something that plants do. It's, I mean, it's pervasive across the um, natural world. We're finding all sorts of evidence of hybridization events that are very, very old. So they were hybridizing a long time ago and now more recent hybridization events. So yeah, it's very, it complicates things tremendously, but it sure. does seem to be a little bit family specific. So cichlids um, seem to be just, they just love, they don't care. They just love anyone. They're, they they hybridize like crazy. Whereas other groups don't seem to have that signal of hybridization in their history or contemporary populations. So it's a bit of a mix, I think, um, but, but clearly hybridization is much more um, widespread than we originally thought. I mean, I know plants, people are always recognize that hybridization is pervasive, but with animals that, that, that changed for a long time, but it's definitely going back now, which, you know, raises all sorts of questions about, you know, what's a species and, you know, when we, when we say, when, when we can say evolutionary trajectory is over, you know, they seem to separate, but then they're gonna go back together again, so. Right. Um, thank you, that's super interesting. I, I'm going to ask two more questions from the chat. Um, we're running low on time now. Um, starting with um, a very general question, but a very important question, which is um, very generally about the, the, your perspective on the larger and human world implications of your findings. I imagine that maybe the conservation um, bit at the end is one of those findings. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I just, this, this is a, as I said, it's a, it's a treasure. I think this, this system is a nat natural treasure and it's obviously a treasure for the people who live there. I mean, you know, putting major dams in is gonna disrupt those lives just completely. Um, but in terms of what it can teach us about speciation, diversification, all of those things, I mean, this is an amazing place and it would just be tragic if, uh, if those dams go ahead. It really, really would be. Yeah. I'm sure that uh, answer the question, but I think. <laughs> no, I Sorry. think that's, that's a wonderful answer. Um, and then uh, the last question I have is, is um, whether saltwater species migrate into the Congo River. And yeah, I guess generally just how much of a kind of a gradient from, from saltwater to freshwater do you see? Right. So the, the Congo, um, as I suggested, kind of plunges down into, into yeah. Atlantic. So it doesn't really have an, it does have a kind of estuary. It doesn't have a delta. It, it does have a mouth as it plunges in. Um, and certainly, you know, you do get the intrusion in the lower part before you start getting to rapids. The minute you start getting to rapids, um, you know, not, no, no marine thing is going to be able to swim up those rapids. But in the sort of lower portion, the estuarine portion, maybe, maybe up to about 70 kilometers, something like that, you will find marine species. And you'll find things like bull sharks and some of the stingrays and all of the, you know, you'll find them there. 
but not getting very far up because basically because all of this water is plunging down and um, you really don't get a big tidal reach in that kind of system at all. But you do get the occasional marine toughy that can make it up a little bit. Sure. Well, wonderful. Um, Melanie, thank you so much. I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else at home learned a lot. And now I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Rochelle to close out the meeting for us. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry it wasn't fish, guys, but there you go. I mean, sorry it wasn't birds and it was fish, but there you go. I just want to say we're a very equal opportunity society. Um, so I, I think I think that, you know, usually a portion of the lectures are not about birds. And this is an amateur naturalist society. So we appreciate all things in the natural world. But I also want to thank, thank Melanie so much. That was an amazing lecture. I learned so much. I'm more fascinated. I'm glad we touched on some of the conservation issues. Um, and it was a great end to what I think was a, another great season on Zoom, not where I thought we would be. I feel sad. We used to go to dinner with the speakers afterwards where we could ask all of the billions of questions that we weren't able to ask in the lectures um, and have you know a great time over um, chips, guacamole, and a margarita, which is you know a perfect meal in my opinion. So anyhow, I encourage everyone to go on Linnean field trips to stay in touch with what we're doing over the summer. Hope to see many of you in any of the green spaces in New York or beyond this summer. And until then, everyone stay safe, take care, and see you in September. <laughs>